Oma Jnana Timadandasya Jnananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Nena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha So we have Mother Kyati to thank for today's theme. <laughs> How to bring the Bhagavad Gita into day-to-day life. Excellent topic. Many people have the Bhagavad Gita all over the world. Many people give the Bhagavad Gita to others. Some people read the Bhagavad Gita, (laughs) but not very many. And fewer still (laughs) apply the principles of the Bhagavad Gita in their everyday life. So, Today we'll talk a little bit about, to start with, a major area where we can apply apply Bhagavad Gita by taking the perspective of Arjuna at the beginning of the battlefield, Battle of Kurukshetra, because as he was in a very tough situation, all of us actually are in a tough situation. And we face many difficult decisions throughout our life. Hardly do they ever come in a very easy way. They both look like a bad choice, either way we go. And that's what the situation Arjuna was in at the beginning of the battle at Kukshetra. And the title of that first chapter is sometimes called the Yoga of Despair. How can one practice yoga by being in despair. Well, that's what we'll talk about today. But first, what comes out in the first two chapters of the Bhagavad Gita is what really matters. And this word matter is a noun and it's also a verb. The noun matter means physical substance in general as distinct from mind and spirit, according to the dictionary. Of course, we would quibble with that because we would also say that mind is a part of matter also, although we say mind over matter (laughs) sometimes. But that's semantics, more or less, definition in our Sankhya philosophy, which Krishna gives in the seventh chapter of Bhagavad Gita. There are gross physical material elements and there are subtle material elements. Mind is among those. But we do have a higher self and a lower self. In any case, the noun means a physical substance in general. And the matter, matter the verb, means to be of importance or have significance. Like someone might say, does that really matter? It means, does it have significance? So the question is, does matter matter? <laughs> does matter, the physical substance, matter? Does it have significance? And so we hear in the scripture over and over again examples, analogies, upside down, sideways, turned around in every direction to convince us that matter doesn't matter. It's only because of my attachment to matter does it matter. Can I have a 10th canto, 14th chapter, please? Near the end. And this... These examples, often Prabhupada speaks about how one may be attracted to a movie star, a very attractive person who's famous and beautiful. Possible? I see, I go to Japan and I see American movie stars everywhere selling beer and cigarettes and coffee, right? I can't remember right offhand the names of the ones who are there, but it doesn't matter. And so sometimes people will pine for the association of such a person. Or a starlet may be considered the epitome of beauty. But as Prabhupada points out, as soon as he or she leaves the physical body behind, that is, as soon as the soul leaves the body of the star or starlet, then no one wants to spend even a few minutes in the same room, which is 
indicative of the fact that what really mattered is gone. And what's left behind doesn't matter anymore. And what made it matter was something else besides the matter. <laughs> and I've given the example many times, but it never ceases to amaze me when I give it. But it's a matter of understanding the difference between I and mine and how I project myself into this world. One of the things people are more attached to than anything else in this world is their car <laughs> because it's a status symbol and for some reason there's just we feel empowered I feel empowered by driving in a car so forth I watch people polishing their cars taking care of them they, they drive them around in clubs right up the street from where I live there's a place called the candy store it's for the the most uh, elite uh, automobiles, their collector's items, they keep them indoors in the candy store. You can only see in when they're having a soiree inside. All these very rich people come and they come and look at their cars that they keep in there. Some of them cost half a million dollars or more. Ain't, you know, older cars, but vintage, perfect condition and so forth. People come very attached to their car. And uh, when someone hits our car, I feel it practically physically myself. For instance, if we're sitting here and we hear outside a noise that somebody's crunching into where you thought you parked your car, you might start perspiring and run to the window. And when you look it out and see that it's somebody else's car, it's just the neighbor's car, then you say, oh, it's no problem anymore. <laughs> I really don't care. Because it's not a problem for you anymore because you don't identify with it. And in this chapter, 10th Canto, 14th chapter, near the end, as we read the other night, Shukadev Goswami is talking about this distinction between the body and the self and how we become attached. And he says, dot, 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 Krishna, 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 Hare, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare, Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare, Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama Hare Hare. Okay. This is just after Lord Brahma offers his prayers in, in the 14th chapter of the 10th canto. And Shukadev Goswami mentions that Krishna is the soul of all souls. He says that we're attached to our body because we're in the body. He says, uh, Shukadev says, O best of kings, the embodied soul is self-centered. He is more attached to his own body and self than to his so-called possessions like children, wealth, and home. Indeed, for a person who thinks the body is the self, O best of kings, those things whose importance lies only in their relationship to the body are never, dear, never as dear as the body itself. He says, if a person comes to the stage of considering the body mine instead of me, he will certainly not consider the body as dear as his own self. After all, even as the body is growing old and useless, one's desire to continue living remains strong. The difference between mine and me, so there's a way in which, just like I identify with my car, I identify with the body and I become attached to it. And this is the problem that Arjuna has at the very beginning of the Bhagavad Gita. And it sets up the instruction that Krishna gives in the second chapter of the Gita, 
In a very important verse, 216 of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance, and of the eternal, the soul, there is no change. This they have concluded by studying the nature of both. So this is profound, and it's the essence, the foundation of spiritual life. Those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existent, the material body, there is no endurance. So how is it that the body, he's, the translation is that the, the body is non-existent? And has no endurance. Do you want to say? There has to be some supervision out there. It can't just be wild time outside the kids. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, is it non existent in the sense that you do not identify with the dualities related with the body? and also the pains and pleasures? Well, what he's, he's distinguishing between the, the existent and the non-existent. And here he's saying that the body is non-existent or non-enduring, and then the soul exists forever and never changes. You were going to say? It doesn't exist in the spiritual reality in the, from the perspective of spiritual reality? Well, it's not that it doesn't exi exist. And it does exist. Uh, it's being stated like that here as a contrast to spirit. In the material world, from the bodily conception of life, there is the idea that spirit is something insubstantial wispy it doesn't it it's you can't really define it and if someone starts talking about spiritual things everyone say oh that's just faith that's not substantial i want hard science the body is real whereas this idea of a soul and faith and a, a spiritual world this is all nebulous amorphous i can't really you can't really put your uh, finger on it so to speak but here krishna is saying just the opposite he's saying the material body and all the energy that it's made of is constantly changing. It's completely, it's always in flux. And this even a physicist nowadays say, right? In quantum physics and so forth, there, the, the idea that the material world may look like it has forms and shapes, but those are simply various uh, vibrations. And they're not really substantial. They can change at any time. According to quantum physics, things can drastically change all of a sudden and become something else. And so Krishna is saying a similar thing here, that the matter that we think is very important and, and which we invest ourselves into is practically saying it's non-existent because you can't hold on to it. It's always changing. However, I project myself into these things, and the Shastra says, Asango hyayam purushaha. We actually have nothing to do with these material things, but myself, which is substantial, becomes uh, fixated on certain things, and I change them from just things into my things. And there's a big difference between things and my things. If someone accidentally picks up your purse and walks out tonight by accident, it's it's a problem because that was your purse. <laughs> so uh, this verse helps to unravel the mystery of why I'm suffering in the material world, and he's offering this to Arjuna as a remedy for the problem that he's facing right now, which is that he's in complete anxiety and attached to his family members. He's not sure if he should do his duty or not. And his, as Krishna tells him at the beginning of the second chapter, all of that is misplaced emotion. He said, you're talking like a person who's learned, but actually you're a fool. He says indirectly, Prabhupada says he's calling him a fool because you're investing yourself in all these things that are changing that you have really have nothing to do with. So, 
I, I came across this article, even in, from the perspective of our daily lives. There's, there's a way in which I become absorbed in many things that don't really matter. And when I'm in distress, and when I'm in despair, and when I'm threatened, uh, and my life is at stake, then I start to winnow out all those things that aren't so important, isn't it? We heard how Akanka was telling a story at our house the other day, about New Vrindavan in the early days. She was there, uh, and her house started burning down. So she ran out of the house, and at that time, Radna Swami was a brahmachari. He was walking by, and she said, please help save my Bhagavatams <laughs> so he, and my beads. <laughs> That's what she wanted to be saved. So he ran in the house and also almost got burned and uh, you know, grabbed a few things and brought them out and so forth. Uh, oftentimes people, you know, during these very trying uh, times when the house is burning or there's a flood or something, they'll go, well, who do they save? The pet. Well, of course, the children first and then the, the pet and everything like that. The TV, you know, <laughs> it's not so important. Anyway, this is an interesting article that just gives the perspective. This article is called, uh, it's, it's from a, a blog called Stronger at Broken Places. Stronger at Broken Places. And it, you might know that, you know, when a bone breaks in your body, it grows back. If it's set properly, not eight times stronger than it was before. It's nature's way. It heals stronger than it was. So the article by a, 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 an educated couple, it says, it's called, What Really Matters? And the subtitle is, Don't Wait for a Crisis to Remind You How Much Your Loved Ones Matter. It was the summer of 1990, and Linda and I were finally on the getaway that we had been looking forward to for years. Both of us were fried to a crisp from months of overwork. We had been hanging on by our fingernails until the kids left for three weeks of overnight camp. For the first time since our move to California eight years earlier, we were finally going to get to see Yosemite, just the two of us. The idea of having a week to ourselves with nothing to do and no one to take care of seemed almost too good to be true. We had arrived at Yosemite around dinner time the day before and spent the night at the Crane Flats campground just inside the western boundaries of the park. The next morning we had breakfast, left our gear in the tent, and drove to the valley floor to spend the day hiking. On the way back down the trail, we noticed that a plume of smoke from the fire in the distance that we had first seen in the late morning was much bigger and thicker. It was spreading over a large portion of the sky and seemed to be moving towards the valley. By the time we got to the visitor center, it was early evening and there was already smoke in the air. A large group of people had gathered near the main entrance and a ranger was speaking to them using a microphone. He was saying something about blankets being distributed and all roads out of the valley being closed because of the fire. What's happening? I asked a tall bearded man standing next to me. There are 14 separate lightning fires in the park. They've jumped the three roads leading out of here. There's no way for anyone to leave the valley. We're all stuck here. Until when? I asked, realizing immediately the ridiculousness of my question. Until they get control of the fire, the ranger has no idea when that might be. It could be hours. Maybe days. Days, I said incredulously. What if the fire keeps moving down towards the valley? It's already pretty smoky here, and this place is like a bowl. I know, he said patiently. We'll all just have to wait and see. Linda and I got in line to get our blankets. We asked the woman who handed them to us if there was any way for us to find out about our gear in the campground. It's probably been destroyed in the fire. There's been a lot of damage to that section of the park. My heart sank, not because of our lost gear, but because I was beginning to realize the reality of the situation. We are in the midst of a major disaster and helpless to do much of anything or go anywhere. I thought of our children and very briefly considered the possibility that I may not see them again. It was too much to contemplate. 
My rational mind kept trying to reassure me that everything would be fine, but the truth was that I was scared. We were directed to the lobby of the Awani Lodge, a beautiful old elegant hotel not far from the visitor's center. I've always wanted to stay here, I told Linda, but this isn't exactly what I had in mind. <laughs> At least we're together. That's what counts, she said, responding to my unspoken anxiety. I guess this is as good a place as any to die in, better than most, I said, weakly attempting to lighten things up. Linda grimaced, grimaced and put her arm around me. We took our blankets into the large room where everyone was directed to park themselves on a spot on the floor and, and get, quote-unquote, comfortable for the night or for however long we were going to be there. People kept coming in until the floor was literally covered with bodies. The room was stuffy, noisy, and crowded. Everyone was friendly, and we all did what we could to adjust to an exciting but stressful situation. None of us knew what was in store for us. At about 11 o'clock, I suggested that we might be more comfortable in the car. Linda agreed. We went out to the lot and saw lights on inside of lots of other cars. Apparently, other people had had the same idea. Inside, we reclined the driver's and passenger seat, opened up the sunroof, lay back, and hoping to see stars, looked up into the night sky. But of course, smoke had clouded the sky already. The cool air touched with the scent of smoke drifted into the car. For a long time, we both just lay back with our eyes open, listening to the stillness within us and between us. You know, Linda said, finally breaking the silence, this could be our last night together. Could be our last night on Earth. Don't be ridiculous. We're not going to die here tonight. They'll probably get at least one of the roads open by morning. Probably, but what if it was? What if this was our last night together? What if we only had a few more hours before it was all over? What would you want to do? How would you want to spend that t the time that we had left? I thought for a moment and then turned to my side and looked at her. I want to spend it here right now doing what we're doing, just feeling how much connected we are. I think that we'll probably make it through the night, but if we don't, there's worse ways to go. I agreed, said Linda. I agree, said Linda. In some ways, I feel we're closer now than we've ever been before. I've got an idea. Let's spend tonight as if it really is our last night together. We'll say whatever it is we would do and say if we only had a few hours more to be together. Well, one thing I know is I, uh, I would uh, not do is sleep, Linda said. I wouldn't want to miss an instant of the brief time that we had left. I don't know that there's much I would really want to do, though. Just staying here together would be enough. Me too. And that's what we did. We stayed up all night just being together, sometimes in conversation, sometimes in the space between the words. We shared what needed to be shared in order to feel complete with each other. We forgave each other for what needed forgiveness. We expressed the gratitude and acknowledgement that had been unspoken. We connected through our words, through feelings, and even through the stillness that came when there was nothing left to say. We managed to stay awake most of the night, but we dozed off briefly from time to time. We were awake when the sun started to come up, though the magic of the night was beginning to fade. I was feeling complete, emotionally full, overflowing. The sound of car engines starting brought me back to the so-called real world. There was a tap on the driver's window. A ranger was at the window. Highway 120 is open. We need to get everybody out of here right away. It might close up any time. Say no more, I said. We're out of here. He didn't, and we were. If someone, had asked, if someone asked me to think of the most deeply intimate experience that I've ever had, it would be that night 23 years ago in Yosemite. In those hours of incredible closeness, nothing mattered except the pure joy of being together with whatever presented itself to us. It was magical, and then it seemed we had transcended the kind of thinking that usually dominated our awareness. Opening us not only to an experience of profound connection, but to one that left us both changed with a deep understanding of what really matters in life. When we are mindful, it becomes easier to prioritize our time in a way that lets us savor our connection with loved ones more fully. And any circumstance that brings us back to this awareness is indeed a great blessing. Don't wait for life-threatening situation to remind you of what really matters in life. Seize the moment. You never know how many more you'll have. So I just 
I th thought that was an interesting level of perception. We are perceptions change according to the circumstances we're in in life. And I may think so, there are so many things that matter that are important. But when I'm in this threatening situation where I think I might die any time now, I immediately throw those all away. And I s s strip down to the more essential aspects of life. And for those who are inclined towards uh, God, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Vida Bhajante Mam Jana Sukritino Arjuna Arto Jignasa Artarti Gyani Cha Bharatarshava. He mentions how those who are in distress, those who are in, in need of wealth, those who are inquisitive, those who are self realized, and so forth, they're pious souls and they, they turn towards me at these difficult times, especially. So, this yoga of despair that Arjuna is going through is very instructive. Going to Arjuna in the Gita, first of all, giving a, 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 a definition of despair, it's a noun, the complete loss of ab or absence of hope. And just so you wanted to know what hope meant. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for, for a certain thing to happen. <laughs> Anybody ever tell you it's not going to happen? Yes, yeah, so this word despair, it comes from, from Latin, disper, disperere, day, down from, sperere, to hope. So your hope goes down. There's no, no more hope. <laughs> There's, that's despair. So, uh, in the Gita, Arjuna says, I didn't expect for this to happen. Whatever I thought was going to happen, the opposite is happening. And Prahlad Maharaj talks about how uh, in the material world, whatever we expect to happen, the opposite will happen. And here it is in the, in the Gita, first chapter, verses 32 through 35. Arjuna is saying, O Govinda, of what avail to us are a kingdom, happiness, or even life itself, when all those for whom we may desire them are now arrayed on this battlefield? Umada Sudana, when teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, maternal uncles, fathers-in-law, grandsons, brothers-in-law, and other relatives are ready to give up their lives and properties and are standing before me, why should I wish to kill them, even though they might otherwise kill me? O maintainer of all living entities, I am not prepared to fight with them, even in exchange for the three worlds, let alone this earth. What pleasure will we derive from killing the sons of Dhritarashtra? So, the whole first chapter it, uh, shines a, a light on the bodily conception of life, starting from the first verse when Dhritarashtra says, Dharma Kshetri Kuru Kshetri Samabeta Yuyutsava Mamaka Pandavas Chaiva Kimakurvata Sanjaya. That what's happening with my sons and the sons of Pandu, he, he makes this distinction, Mamaka. I'm, a, I'm attached. My eye has become my my. And because he's attached, he has a vested interest and he's fearful. And now Arjuna is experiencing this, uh, distress because. He's naming all of these various relatives and friends and teachers and so forth that he sees on the battlefield. And because he has a sense that these are my people, then he's in distress. In 2.6, Arjuna says, nor do we know which is better, conquering them or being conquered by them. In 2.7, by nature's own way, Prabhupada says in a purport, the complete system of material activities is a source of perplexities for everyone. And I pulled this out as a sutra from the purport. I'll read it again. By nature's own way, the complete system of material activities is a source of perplexities for everyone. You want to hear it again? So you don't so feel so bad about your life? By nature's own way, the complete system of material activities is a source of perplexity perplexities for everyone. So everyone undergoes the perplexities as long as 
he or she is uh, invested in the material energy. It's a perplexing energy. It's, na it's natural, naturally created that way. So what does that mean? What does that perplexity mean? What I'm getting at here is that this despair that we experience and frustration that we experience is an indication of our higher nature. And I'll, I'll read a section from the Srimad Bhagavatam 2.2.35, in which Prabhupada, uh, in the verse, uh, Shukadeva Goswami is explaining how one can become aware of one's existence separate from the body by being introspective and looking carefully. And one of the things he says is that one can notice how one's getting intelligence. And he says that's the form direction of the super soul. Super soul is giving us intelligence. Where does that come from? I just got some intelligence. It came to me. And um, yeah, we're being supplied with, with uh, everything. And in this purport, Prophet says, actually the Lord is not perceivable by our present materialized senses. But when one is convinced of the presence of the Lord by a practical service attitude, there is a revelation by the Lord's mercy, and such a pure devotee of the Lord can perceive the Lord's presence always and everywhere. The spiritual quality of the seer is manifest in our dissatisfaction with the limited state of materially conditioned existence. That is the difference between matter and spirit. Listen to this difference between matter and spirit again. Prabhupada says, the spiritual quality of the seer is manifest in our dissatisfaction with the limited state of materially conditioned existence. Goes back to the, how the material nature is full of perplexities for one who is absorbed in it. Abhinibeshita means I become absorbed in it, in the, in the workings of the material nature. And because of that, I'll feel dissatisfaction. Does that ring a bell? Dissatisfaction with the workings of the material nature? Or do you feel completely satisfied with everything you've gotten? <laughs> or is it just me? <laughs> yes? yes? Dissatisfaction? Yes. When did you ever feel dissatisfaction? Always? <laughs> Can you think of a specific time in your life when you were dissatisfied with the workings of material nature? Dissatisfaction with the limited state of materially conditioned existence. Yes. I'm feeling dissatisfaction right now with that <laughs> microphone was, situation. Okay, go ahead. It's coming to the temple row in the like while driving. I could see lots of people just trying to rush through, and definitely was a very dissatisfying experience. You just the energy of people rushing around. You felt yeah. dissatisfied and trying to yeah just cut through you and you know get ahead. Yeah, I hate that too. Okay, what else? Dissatisfaction from the Limited. It's just um, a few people got laid off like uh, three weeks back from my company and there was one of my friend and he was, he was first of all dissatisfied with how his project was going on and all that. But then adding more to that when he got laid off, he just came in at 11 o'clock and then he, they let him know. But then when he left, he felt more dissatisfied, like, and then he, he was saying that, oh, even though I was not happy, I was coming here like a home for 11 years, and now I'm completely dissatisfied. No, they didn't even give one hour notice, so it's complete dissatisfaction. And there was the, the thing he was dissatisfied with, now that he's taken away from it, he started to think, well, maybe it wasn't such a bad sat dissatisfaction <laughs> as this is even worse. Okay, yes, more, and Hansa Priya in the back. Prahlad's prayers, uh, seven, chapter, uh, Canto 7 9. I took today and tomorrow off so I can get my closet and everything cleaned up because I haven't been doing so much at weekend. And I stayed home and I just got much more anxiety that I think how much I didn't get to it and the neighbors, the vacuums are bothering me, the, the gardeners are cleaning, the dogs are barking, and I just end up more annoyed then. Being gone to work, probably I would be better off. <laughs> so you stayed home to clean up your closet. Your boss not watching this, right? <laughs> and, 
Because <laughs> he might be dissatisfied. Official... What? She said she was sick. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm official PTO to just feel, get clean, get relaxed, and take a break and all that, but end up being more tired. <laughs> Yoga some yoga. You know that verse? Vyoga some yoga. You can just find Vyoga some yoga. Dissatisfaction. It's built into the uh, limited nature of the material world. I, I was in Vrindavan one year f for the month of Kartik, and then I had to come into Delhi for something. I came with my friend Prem Kishore, and we got to the I think I had to change some money, or I can't remember what it was, but it was some financial dealings that required a passport and a credit card and everything. And I pulled out the credit card, it was the wrong one, and immediately I started feeling the, the um, dissatisfaction. I didn't notice it first, but my, my friend said to me, just see, a few minutes out of the time and engaged in these activities and you'll feel dissatisfied. So there's a limited, there are limited resources. This is the whole science of economics. It's based on this idea that there are limited resources and how do we deal with that. And there are, from moment to moment, uh, distractions, ways in which that uh, I don't get what I want or I'm separated from what I do want and so forth. So there's this dissatisfaction. So yoga of despair, yoga of dissatisfaction. We're hearing a very positive aspect to these things. That sense of dissatisfaction means that you don't belong to the material world. If you could be satisfied by the goings-on of this world and saw everything as just fine, the way things work here, then uh, you would say that you're in harmony with the material nature, but you're never in harmony with the material nature. You're out of, out of sync. So Prabhupada is saying here in this sutra, the spiritual quality of the seer is manifest in our dissatisfaction. Otherwise, you couldn't be dissatisfied with it because you're something higher. You're something more than this. So that's the problem. I'm identifying with a lower energy. That's the problem. And in... Thank you. That's not it. Some yoga, the yoga. Yes, it is it. Thank you. Perfect. Good for you. Yes, mat priya priya yoga. Some yoga janma. So this is uh, seven nine seventeen. Prahlad Maharaj in his prayer says to Lord Nishingadev, O great one, O supreme Lord, because of combination with pleasing and displeasing circumstances, because of separation from them, one is placed in a most regrettable position within heavenly or hellish planets, as if burning in a fire of lamentation. Although there are many remedies by which to get out of miserable life, any such remedies in the material world are more miserable than the miseries themselves. <laughs> Therefore, I think that the only remedy is to engage in your service. Kindly instruct me in such service. What? Go ahead, say what you're thinking. No, it's just when they say, although there are many remedies by which to get out of the miserable life, any such remedies in the material world are more miserable than the miseries themselves. I'm totally lost. Okay, let me give you an example. Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of this, but there's a law. When, they, when pharmaceutical companies advertise a new drug, they have to list all the side effects. And oftentimes... You might have seen or heard this before. They'll tell you what the new drug is. Get new, what's a good name? <laughs> Fix all, huh? Sleep X. Get new Sleep X, and, and then they tell what it is, they tell what it does, and then for a half an hour, there's a list of all the things. You may experience dry mouth, nausea, death. Even some of them say death, right? <laughs> I mean, listen here, yeah. let's get some of that. <laughs> Dry mouth, nausea, death, bleeding from all pores in your body and everything like that. It's like, okay. And it uh, takes millions and millions of dollars to invent these new drugs because they're trying to ward off the miseries of material existence. And what happens, there's 
some side effect that comes from that. So in, in all kinds of circumstances, when I try to readjust my situation in the material world, I can make it worse. I make it worse than it was before, these kinds of remedies. Shraddha? So Maharaj, um, 30 years ago when I started my career in computers, they, they were very, very old computers with very different types of keyboards. And so if you had to go up and down the screen, you really had to use the up arrow and do that. And I always used to dream that there could be some sort of a pointing device that you know you could just move instead of having to use this. And then the mouse came. <laughs> and then the mouse was also bad because you had to move your hands like that. And I used to think, what if there was something right inside the keyboard and then the joystick came there like that? And then <laughs> after using that, you know, I got permanent injuries to my hands. Like, you know, so this is a classic example of um, the remedy being worse than the original melody. <laughs> you, you get it and then it's not good enough and it, there's yes. some side effect. And we see all the time, I mean, it's just amazing how. Uh, we fly through the air on airplanes. I, I live near the airport. I've always loved airports ever since I was a kid. I ended up growing up in one practically. As I, I distributed books in airports for many years. And uh, in any case, it's a miracle that we're flying. If you look at the old films or hear the histories of the Wright brothers who invented the first airplanes, it's quite uh, an arduous you know, research project and development and everything like that. And when they f actually first flew an airplane, it was international acclaim and everyone came to see what happened and, and it was an amazing thing. And nowadays, you know, people sit in airplanes, they have the latest technology is that you can have internet, high speed internet while you're flying. And you'll notice that people, you know, even the latest technology comes out and it just came out, you know, a couple months ago or something, and people sit down, and then it, there's a glitch. And they go, I can't believe it, it doesn't work. I mean, you're flying through the air, and <laughs> c communicating with people on the other side of the earth at the same time, and the mind is, is so dissatisfied that there was a glitch, you know, that something didn't work. And um, even cell phones, what an amazing thing it is. I mean, how it even works. I was talking to Maharaj about this on the way to the program last night. He was saying, I have no idea how these things work. But it's miraculous how, you know, someone figures out the equations and we're communicating, even looking at somebody else's face. But now when the new iPhones come out, they're doomed before they come out because all the critics just say, it's not good enough. It's not radical enough, you know. You can run an airline off that little thing, and still it's not good enough. So the mind never becomes you know, satisfied in the material world. But there's a way through this yoga of despair there, that we oftentimes become stripped down to the uh, bare necessities of life and realize oh, what I have is very valuable, my life, my life, and the life of others, and all the, th the external considerations when I realize in, a, in an instant that I'll lose them become um, very insignificant. So this uh, cultivation, Arjuna is in this bewildering situation, and then he turns to Krishna and says that, I don't know what to do. I really am confused. I'm perplexed. I'm perplexed by this whole situation. So he turns to his uh, friend, Krishna, and he says, okay, now you be my guru. And at first, uh, Arjuna, uh, Krishna doesn't answer right away and says, I'll be your guru. He, there's a, f a few verses before he actually agrees to it and then begins to instruct Arjuna. And the, f the instructions that he gives him in the second chapter are the remedy for this bewildering situation to understand that the matter doesn't matter. What matters is something, a much higher principle. It's the actual... Uh, essence of who I am, the spirit soul. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur says in his song, Jeev Krishna Das A B Shwas Korleto Ardukonai. That if you just change your consciousness a little bit and you say, I'm a servant. That's who I am. I'm a servant of the servant. He said, then this perplexity will go away. And so this is a very practical um, it's very practical. 
what the Bhagavad Gita is teaching, because every one of us, Prabhupada says in the introduction to the Gita, is threatened by non-existence. We're being stalked by the tigress of death. And around any corner that we turn, she can be there. I just heard Prabhupada speaking this morning. He was saying the Shukadev Goswami had seven years to live. And he said, excuse me, Marsh Prikshit had seven days to live. And uh, he took it so seriously. He said, we don't know if we have even seven minutes. He said, but everyone is thinking, I have seven millions of years. <laughs> this is, <laughs> and when someone dies, I think that uh, he's dying, but I won't die. This is Maya. So to become um, aware of the fact that I'm surrounded by uh, a, a, an energy that is bound to be perplexing is a, a, a very practical step towards uh, detachment and being satisfied because I'm not simply identifying with it and, and keeping a high expectation. Despair means lo hopeless, loss of hope. I don't have any hope for the material world. And that's for people who are uh, ready to advance spiritually. Any tinge of hope I have in the, in the material energy will cause this dissatisfaction. So this is a little bit theoretical, but it's actually practical because we can observe ourselves, the state of mind we're in, and we can distinguish between the material things that are around us and, and see, how am I identifying with them? Do I see them as tools to use in Krishna's service or am I attached to them? And the more I'm attached to them and thinking these are mine, I have to control them, the more I suffer and the more I'm bewildered. And the more that I see them as useful in Krishna's service, the more I'll feel satisfaction. And now we'll take some reflections or questions. Anything that you heard that stuck in your mind? Kyati. Back. Back, back, back. We were just talking about despair and... Give her one, two. Okay, go ahead. That's all right. Now, I was just a quick thing. I had taken like so many notes and the verse numbers and the whole thing crashed and my notes are gone. <laughs> and I paid so Perfect. much for the <laughs> Case in point. <laughs> and you didn't have backup? <laughs> Why didn't you back it up? <laughs> Thank you, that really helped. Sometimes we are so much attached to the way we want to do our spiritual practice. Even that leads to dissatisfaction because not all the time th uh, things are so favorable. And then you come into that question that is it my desire that I want to have it this way or is it right or is it wrong? So you fall into that uh, mystical question that am I doing things right? Is it the right way? And then you increase your self-doubt. So what should we do in that case? Well, we have to take uh, direction. Interesting, we were hearing about even uh, Vyasadev. The other day, Maharaj was speaking about the Srimad Bhagavatam, and even he was following Shastra, and still he was dissatisfied. <laughs> and then he had to hear from his guru, who gave him the insight that you need to do this. So uh, even in spiritual life, we may feel some, uh, we may reach a plateau or we may feel f frustrated in a certain way. And we have to take help, so help from, uh, take superior guidance from someone who can give us perspective. And Prabhupada talks about how Vidura was a pure devotee. But he approached Uddhava, who then deferred to Maitreya, and he took instruction from Maitreya, who had been in the association of Krishna and heard directly from him, along with Uddhava. But Prabhupada mentions that although Vidura was a pure devotee, he still needed to take help. So there's a way that um, we have to, um, as we are practicing our spiritual life, continually take good association, 
higher association so that we can get good guidance. And we also have to regularly refer to the scriptures as well. Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra, it's very um, real. It's, we have to realign ourselves every day. Actually, when we wake up in the morning, we need to start over again. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur used to give the example that in the morning you need to beat your mind with shoes, at night with broomsticks. But th this is indicating that even as one's practicing spiritual life, there may be um, questions or I've, I may be going off track, so I have to take constant help from the scripture and from higher uh, devotees who can direct me, give me perspective. Yeah, that's helpful. Banabhata Prabhu? Yeah, uh, what stuck in my mind, because I was reading it in another purport somewhere, where Srila Prabhupada talks about uh, the complexities of this material of the nature of material existence is that there are complexities there. And he was talking in uh, purport somewhere about how, it might even be in, in this Prahlad's prayers, how um, you know, the nature of materialistic thought is we think that to become happy in the material world is going to be easy. When it's actually because the nature of complexities in the material world, it never is. And that's the source of, you know, probably more anxiety than anything else people go through because they start, you know, experiencing the material desires. Their mind says, oh, it's pretty easy. All you have to do is this and this and this and this. And then they start the process and uh, it ends up being, you know, completely different than they, than they had. So in my mind, it's, it's um, really, really important that we you know, fix that understanding in our mind that when we're dealing with anything in the material world, it's going to be complex. It's not going to be uh, simple. Manage your expectations. Now, there's also a story of the forest fire in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Can I have 10th Canto, 17th chapter? Or do I already have it? I may have it right here. Now in Vrindavan, we'll notice that there are lots of anomalies. It's not every day that a big snake comes into the village. Kaliya was swimming in the Jamuna and camped out there, it made everything so poisonous that all the trees, vegetation died, even the birds would fly over, they would fall down dead and so forth. The cows drinking the water, and after that pastime, when Krishna jumped in that lake and then danced on the heads of Kaliya, right afterwards, just as the whole village was recovering, because it was a traumatic experience that Krishna had jumped in the, in the poisoned lake and it was thrashing around just to attract the attention of Kaliya, who then became angry and then grabbed Krishna in his coils, and he held them there for hours. And then Krishna's mother and the whole village, everyone came down and saw Krishna. Little boy, they're the synergy of, their eye, of, of everyone in the whole village. And there he was trapped in the coils of this fearsome snake. And how emotionally, um, I should say, uh, heart-wrenching, thank you, how emotionally heart-wrenching that was for everyone. And of course, it, Krishna was doing it to increase their attachment for him. But right after that happened, see, in the story of, of the history of Kaliya, it's mentioned that the residents of Obesa King Pariksit Rest of kings, Pariksit, because the residents of Vrindavan were feeling very weak from hunger, thirst, and fatigue, they and the cows spent the night where they were, lying down near the bank of the Kalindi, 
That's because of that whole experience with, with Kaliya. Srila Jiva Goswami points out that although the people were weak from hunger and thirst, they did not drink the milk from the cows present there because they feared it had been contaminated by the serpent's poison. The residents of Vrindavan were so overjoyed to get back their beloved Krishna that they did not want to go back to their houses. They wanted to stay with Krishna on the bank of the Jamuna so they could continuously see him. Thus they decided to take rest near the river bank. Text 21, during the night, while all the people of Vrindavan were asleep, a great fire blazed up within the dry summer forest. The fire surrounded the inhabitants of Vraj on all sides and began to scorch them. Purport, Srila Sanatan Goswami and Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur have commented that perhaps a loyal friend of Kaliya had assumed the form of a forest fire to avenge his friend, and perhaps the forest fire was manifest by a demon who was a follower of Kamsas. 22. Then the residents of Vrindavan woke up, extremely disturbed by the great fire threatening to burn them. Thus they took shelter of Krishna, the Supreme Lord, who by his spiritual potency appeared like an ordinary human being. Purport, the Shruti or Vedic mantras state, Swaruputaya, Nitya Shaktyamaya Kyakya. The Lord's external potency, named Maya, is innate in his original form. Thus, within the eternal spiritual body of the Supreme Lord, there is infinite potency which effortlessly manipulates all existence according to the omniscient desire of the absolute truth. The residents of Vrindavan took shelter of Krishna thinking, this blessed boy will certainly be empowered by God to save us. Mm -hmm. They remembered the words of the sage Gargamuni spoken at the birth ceremony of Lord Krishna. Anena sarva durgani yuyam anjas, anjas tarishyata. By his power, you will easily be able to cross over all obstacles. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the residents of Vrindavan who had full faith in Krishna took shelter of the Lord in hopes of being saved from the impending disaster threatened by the forest fire. 23. Vrindavan's residents said, Krishna, Krishna, O Lord of all opulence, O Rama, possessor of unlimited power, this most terrible fire is about to devour us, your devotees. O Lord, we are your true friends and devotees. Please protect us from this insurmountable fire of death. We can never give up your lotus feet, which drive away all fear. Purport, the residents of Vrindavan told Krishna, if this deadly fire overcomes us, we will be separated from your lotus feet, and this is unbearable for us. Therefore, just so that we can go on serving your lotus feet, please protect us. Text 25, seeing his devotees so disturbed, Sri Krishna, the infinite Lord of the universe and possessor of infinite power, then swallowed the terrible forest fire. Thus end the purports of the humble servants of his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, to the 10th canto, 17th chapter of Srimad Bhagavatam, entitled The History of Kaliya. So in, when, one is, when the devotees are in distress or threatened, then they immediately uh, take shelter of Krishna, who is the shelter of the entire cosmic manifestation. Samashritaye pada palava palavam mahat param punya yasho marare pavam budir vatsa padam param padam 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 yad vipadam natesham. That Krishna is the shelter of the whole universe. He's the killer of the Mura demon. And one should not take shelter of this material world, which is vipadam. It means it's danger at every step. And um, we find in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, um, Sutta Goswami says that one should take shelter of the holy name because it's Krishna personified. Krishna is fully present in his name. And any danger that comes to you in this material world, any distress, you can simply say, Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! 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 Hare Hare! Hare Hare! Hare Rama! Hare Rama! Hare Rama! Hare Rama! Rama Rama! Rama Hare Hare. Hare Hare. The vibration is so powerful that it, will, uh, it is feared by fear personified, Sutta Goswami says. So one should take shelter of this name. Apana samsritim goran yanama vishogranan tatasadyo vimucheta yad bipeti swayambayam. 
So the, um, the devotees are, are constantly uh, taking shelter of Krishna, who then uh, reciprocates uh, from within their hearts and in their lives to uh, give them shelter from the perplexities of the material world. A beautiful verse Krishna speaks in the ninth chapter of the Gita where he says, Yoga Kshemam Bahamiyaham. Those who, who just uh, transfer this anxiety of the material world and the absorption in, the, in things of the material world to uh, thinking of serving Krishna. Ananyas chintayanto mam. So ananyas chintayanto mam means the whole consciousness of the devotee who is absorbed in thinking how to serve Krishna and is thinking of Krishna. There's no other consideration. Yejana paripasate. Tesham nityab yuktanam yoga kshemam baham yaham. For such a person, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. He gives the intelligence so that we can overcome the perplexities of the material nature as well. And so the remedy is to uh, turn to Krishna for help, just like Arjuna did when he was in despair. And he said, now I've, I've lost all composure due to miserly weakness. I don't know what my duty is anymore. Now I ask you, please, please instruct me. Any other thoughts? Yes. About the snakes in India, there are a lot of people snakes and a lot of crocodiles. My nephew just died two weeks ago. I'm sorry. And crocodiles just eat him up. I see. And in the river. So people think uh, crocodile is not that strong. But he, he was the best swimmer, and he was used uh, you see Berkeley lawyer, best lawyer. And he, he says he, he knows the swimming. So he went there and this crocodile came and ate him up just two weeks ago. Yeah, that, uh, I'm very sorry to hear that. But, you know, there, are, there are rivers like that. And there are, so it's a true story. Gajendra also was taken by a crocodile but saved at the last minute by Krishna when he prayed to him. Yeah, the crocodile's waiting around, well, not around every corner, but <laughs> everywhere we go, the crocodile is, is liable to bite us. Shraddha, was that you? Who, who's next? Yes. Yes, Maharaj, I was thinking about the residence of Vrindavan when, uh, when the fire, they were talking about the fire and praying to Krishna. So um, I was just um, observing the approach to um, their prayer of not wanting to die. And they, they said that um, if we die, then we'll be separated from your lotus feet. So please save us. So it was like using the matter, the body, in the service of the Lord, which is, you know. I mean, their motive was they didn't want to be separated from Krishna, right? Yeah, nice. Hari Vamsha? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, I really like this statement, which you quoted, I think, from Purport, that we are surrounded by energy which is bound to be per perplexing. So we kind of have that disclaimer always in our mind that we probably won't end up getting what we... You know, it's not you. <laughs> it's the, You don't have to adjust your set, exactly. like they used to say. Uh, it's <laughs> there's, a, there's a constant disturbance in the material world. And the Bhagavatam is giving us the solution, take shelter of Krishna. And um, I wanted to you know, connect it with, even in our spiritual life, since we are also dealing with the material plane, we, we are bound to have a lot of anxieties. So I, I, we were just at Google and Maharaj was interacting with Marli Mataji and he was saying how we we like transcendental anxiety. We don't want to be peaceful. We want to have transcendental anxiety so that we can always keep on turning towards Krishna. Yeah, that's a nice point. And there's a way in which uh, I was just 
reading today, Prabhupada was extolling service to the Lord. And especially he says that uh, by one's service, one comes to see the Lord face to face. That um, as we perform our service, we, we, when we are, connect to it in a, in a very authorized way, and we take shelter of our service, then uh, amidst the perplexities, we know what to do. Because there's a way in which, although even as we're performing our duties, our spiritual duties, there, may, there will be obstacles. And that kind of anxiety facing those kinds of obstacles is not detrimental or it's not uh, innervating. It doesn't take away our energy. Um, because we understand that by becoming entangled with mo removing those obstacles, we're becoming more and more uh, connected to Krishna. Whereas in the material world, the disconnect uh, uh, between our activities and our actual self-interest uh, leaves a deep-seated anxiety within the heart. So to, uh, one has to work, one has to use one's senses and so forth, as Krishna says in the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And if we become ent entangled in using our senses to uh, execute our service, and there will be the same kinds of very difficult choices and decisions to make as we do that, but it's transcendental. That's the point Maharaj was making. There's anxiety and there's trepidation and so forth, but it's spiritual. Yes. So Prabhuji, um, we understand about the anxiety, but someone might ask that, um, like how he was mentioning in spiritual life, um, in the end you may not get it. But that type of uh, anxiety lies in spiritual life also, um, where we see that, um, like people might ask, like see how Arjuna was like conquered by um, ordinary f farmers. So, and Bhishma had to s bed of arrows and Rama's father has to die like that. So, what do we, how, how do we define success in, in spiritual life, saying that this is, this is it, and one definitely attains success. How do we define it in spiritual perspective? Whatever brings us closer to Krishna, just like Jatayu, although he was an old bird, he was bound to lose in fighting with Ravan, but he did it anyway. He did his duty. He did the right thing. And because of that, Ram and Lakshman personally came to his funeral and blessed him. And whether we win or lose, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, it doesn't matter as long as you do your service. You may win sometimes, you may lose sometimes, but that's not your business. So that this is the, uh, the mark of success. The devotee is always closer to Krishna. Bhishma Dev was on a bed of arrows. He was defeated in the battle, but who came to his, who his bedside, so to speak, the bed of arrows, was Krishna and Yudhishthir and all the greatest sages. And Krishna was right there when he left. So it's not that uh, devotees won't uh, encounter reversals in this world. In fact, I read you the verse from Prithu Maharaj, who was trying to perform a hundred horse sacrifices, and then Indra got envious, and he kept stealing the horse. <laughs> so he could only do 99, and Prithu wanted to kill him. And then Brahma came down and said, these things are, you know, don't become... Uh, don't try to fix these kinds of uh, big reversals. Just go on with your service and be satisfied. You'll be okay. And the, I mean, the main point is that we remain connected to Krishna in all circumstances. And the devotee has that. Even externally, if it looks like there's some uh, grave difficulty that the devotee's in, actually, the devotee's... Uh, absorbed in taking more shelter of Krishna. You can see that even, uh, uh, who was it? Was somebody who was here recently was telling the story of Jayananda or was I somewhere else? Jayananda Prabhu, who, who was 
we celebrate his disappearance day every year. I think he's the only uh, devotee in ISKCON that we do that for. As Prabhupada uh, really liked Jayananda Prabhu and recognized his service. And he was still here to tell us to observe that disappearance day every year. And uh, he, although he was uh, racked with cancer uh, throughout his body, he went on with the service that was in New York. Nobody even knew. He didn't tell anybody because he wanted to finish his service. And even at the end, uh, when he was in Los Angeles and the devotees were taking care of him, he was in a very uh, humble state of mind and taking deep shelter of Krishna. And he was saying at the very last uh, point of his life, what is the use of this body? I can't do service anymore. So the devotee is really fixed in service and takes shelter of that up until the last moment. And it's not the same. And it's very difficult, actually, to have to give up this body and move on to the next position. If you're ever with somebody who goes through the process, you'll notice that it's very, uh, oftentimes people are concerned in anxiety with how are my relatives gonna be taken care of? Uh, what's gonna happen to my money and will it be distributed properly and so forth? But as Bhagavatam points out, this is not your money anyway. It's just an idea that you have, that you have this money. And these are not really your relatives either. They're, they're, um, they're relative to your position. And you'll pass on to another uh, situation of relatives and money and so forth. But a person who's not been trained in spiritual life, not been practiced in thinking of Krishna at the time of death, doesn't have this yoga balena or the power the strength to actually remember God at the time of death. Narayana Smritihi, the goal, Shukadeva Goswami says early on, is to remember Narayana at the time of death. So we have to practice throughout this lifetime. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. And, you know, people think of so many things when they die because they're attached to the material world. But it's very different for devotees, Vaishnavas who have practiced throughout their life. They have the uh, stability of mind to remember Krishna at the very end and take shelter of him. Hare Krishna. Last reflection? Yes, Nirkula? What you were just um, speaking about reminded me of a story that a devotee in Denver told me when uh, we were just there. She was at the temple and uh, standing next to the fire extinguisher on the wall and it, all of a sudden it just came down and it, it kind of, it, it brazed her uh, leg and uh, it uh, severed her Achilles tendon and she just went down and she went out and uh, she had no control over what she was thinking about or you know, how she was reacting. And she kept uh, passing out and coming to, passing out, coming to. And what she said to me was, she said, the holy name came to me. And she said, I could hear the holy name. And I could, in my mind, I could chant. And she said, and then devotees came and they were chanting the holy name. And she said, when I came, when I would come to, she said, I couldn't relate to anything around me. I, I didn't know I was a human being. I didn't know where I was. I couldn't, I couldn't name things. I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't um, relate to anything that was going on. She said, but the holy name came to me. She said, and, and it, it just increased my faith so much because I couldn't, at that point, make myself think of Krishna. But... Out of, out of his mercy, he came to me in that situation. So it just made me think of how it's a practice, you know, and, and the more we practice, then, and, and Krishna in his name is, is a person, and how he... That's helpful. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that helps. That's good. And in, in the Gita, Krishna says, tasmat sarveshu kaleshu mamanu smarayujicha mayarpita mano budhir mami vaishatya samshaya he tells Arjuna, do your work as a Kshatriya. You've got to go to work. But at the same time, think of me. 
so it's not that we quit our work or quit our involvement with, with the material world. You've got to go to Intel or Google or Apple or <laughs> one of those places, and you have to do your work, but at the same time, remember Krishna and practice that throughout, throughout your life. So a day-to-day, -day, incorporating the Bhagavad Gita into our day-to-day -day life. One thing is to remember that Arjuna was in despair. And if Juna, Arjuna was in despair, we're going to be in despair. So don't despair that you're in despair. Just understand that this is the nature of the material world and react properly. That is, take shelter of Krishna through his instructions, through the holy name. Uh, recommend that, we, that one studies the Bhagavad Gita every day. If you go deeply into the Bhagavad Gita, then your intelligence becomes fortified and you can actually deal with the perplexities of life from Krishna's perspective, from Krishna's point of view and from the advice that he gives. And also to uh, take shelter of the holy name, the story that Nirkula gave is very important because if throughout our life we practice ex um, being helpless and being there for the holy name, just uh, receiving the a grace that descends from, from the holy name, and not making offenses, just trying to be non-offensive and chant the holy name. Just by that, uh, one will become successful in this life. So um, don't become uh, disturbed by the changes of the material world. They're natural. And when they come, take it as an, a, a way to uh, seek more shelter from Krishna. And you'll have plenty of opportunities for that because there's so many disturbances and so many chances every day to become disturbed by uh, prospects of loss and gain and victory and defeat and so forth in this material world. So that's our practice. Yes. My name is Sadish. Hare Krishna Shadi. I'm in town. I'm in town from Stockton. From I'm Stockton. in town Welcome. from Stockton, which is about 80 miles away. I'm here for tonight, and I made a point to come over on Wednesday. Intentionally stayed overnight. However, <clears throat> when you said, when the mind is in turmoil, you see the ups and downs in life. Just now, you said that sentence. Gita says, I do not remember the verse. But it says that when your mind is in turmoil, go in the company of holy men. Go to holy places. It will calm you down. So I'm in town, so I came over here. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we'll end on that note, because it was so sweet. And we're so happy you came all the way from Stockton. And now let's put away all the asans, and we'll get ready for the Artik ceremony where we can simply absorb ourselves in singing for Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman, hey, Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman, Natari Armarman.